All God's blessings, everyone. I'm the Reverend Dr. Chris McMullen, and this is my weekly service of prayer in the Celtic Christian heritage. And this is for the week of the third Sunday in Lent, 2021, March the 14th, 2021. And my liturgy today is from a contemporary Celtic Christian writer and teacher, David Cole. David Cole has written a series of books. His first one that got my attention was in 2017, and this is called 40 Days of the Celtic Saints. Devotional readings for a time of preparation, and I found this to be a wonderful book, looking at uh, 40 different uh, saints in the Celtic Christian mission and what we may learn from them for our own life and Christian service and growth in God's spirit today. Um, he's also produced two wonderful devotional books. One is called Celtic Advent and the other is called Celtic Lent. And these were published in 2018 and they are very good too. I've used them both in Advent and Lent pasts. And then recently in 2020, he produced a fourth one to this series called The Celtic Year, A Rhythm of Prayer and Meditation for Eight Points of the Celtic Year. He goes back to the pre-Christian uh, Celtic calendar and has prayers and meditations for the various seasons and the various high points of the Celtic Year, which was so close to nature and so thoroughly open to the Spirit of God. Um, and certainly the early Christians built on that. All four of these books are produced by Bible Reading Fellowship in Britain, uh, though they're available in North America too, and uh, it's worth uh, looking, looking them up and maybe ordering one or two. But, but most of the service that I've designed, and I provided a bulletin on my script page, the link to it is below the video on YouTube that you're watching, is a book he produced in 2014 called Celtic Prayers and Practices, and Inner Journey. This is published here in North America, anyway, by Annam Cara Publications in Vestal, New York, and it is available. And uh, most of the prayers, like I said, I've put together from that book. He's written several other books, too. I've counted eight books of his. Um, David Cole, or Brother Cassian, as he refers to himself now, I grew up in a very strict uh, church, and in his teenage years, he rejected that and skepticism and cynicism, and then he had a personal encounter with Jesus. And so his interest in spirituality, which had led him to the occult and other things, now became focused on Jesus and became a good, healthy, Trinitarian spirituality. He eventually went on to become an ordained minister, although that didn't really suit his sense of vocation. He was really called to be an Anam Kara and a teacher, and so he established Waymark Ministries in 2010. You can look up Waymark Ministries. They have a wonderful site on the internet. He's available for personal counseling or spiritual direction. He's also available as a theme speaker or a resource person in other ways to conferences. He is the deputy warden and uh, a member of the community of Iden and Hilda. So I thank David for his ministry and my prayers are based on his work today. So we worship God then. From Colossians chapter one, Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The whole of creation came out of balance with its creator, Coles writes. But now it can once again become balanced and reconciled. We are reminded here 
that the work of the cross was not just for the salvation of human beings, but also for the reconciliation of the whole creation, to redress the imbalance. In light of this, how should we act towards the world, especially at this time of what many scientists call a climate crisis? A hymn by Ruth Duck to the Appalachian Celtic tune, Beach Spring. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. Not to preach our creeds or customs, not to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nations, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. We by our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is light. In a humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. As a green bud in the springtime is the sign of life renewed, so may we be signs of oneness, knit earth's peoples many hued. As a rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, may our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and Glorious dawn. Let us pray. Lord of endless inspiration, who keeps the seasons turning and creation renewed, plant in us a renewal of life. As we leave our past behind and look forward to what is to come, Give us the boldness to step out into the future, knowing that you hold all things in your hand. As we walk the path you lay before us, may our past not affect us. May we stand in your righteousness and move forward, wrapped in the knowledge of a clean heart and a clear conscience. Amen. I've chosen the psalm in preparation for the gospel lesson for the third Sunday in Lent in year B, March the 14th, 2021. From John's gospel, I have chosen Psalm 26, which is a, a prayer of repentance and of earnest seeking for personal integrity and goodness that the psalmist may be worthy to worship God in his house. And I'm going to use the 1650 Scottish Psalter metrical version of the psalm, and I'm going to sing it to Brother James Eyre. Brother James was James Laith Macbeth Bain. He died in 1925. This tune of his is quite famous. He wrote it to the 23rd Psalm. Uh, he was known for his work amongst poor people. He was known as a lover of nature. And his ministry was in London and in Perthshire in a spiritualist church. So I like to think that if he was alive today, he would be one of the many who would be delighting to participate in this renaissance of Celtic Christian spirituality. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I trusted also in the Lord, backsliding won't tempt me. Examine me and do me prove, try heart and reins, O God. 
For thy love is before mine eyes, thy truth as I have trod. With persons vain I have not sat, nor with dissemblers lie. So to thine holy altar go, and compass it will I that i with voice of thanksgiving may publish and declare and tell of all thy mighty works that great and wondrous are the habitation of thy house lord i have loved it well Yea, in that place I do delight, where doth thine honour dwell? With sinners gather not my soul, and such as blood would spill. Do thou redeem me, and, O Lord, thy grace in me fulfil my foot upon an even place doth stand with steadfastness within the assembly of the graced the eternal i will bless the habitation of thy house lord i have loved well let us pray a lovely prayer to the Holy Spirit, the Wild Goose, by David Cole. Wild Goose, Holy Spirit of God, release my life, free my shackled heart. Give me freedom to fly with you, to love and to live in such fullness that sky cannot be enough to hold me, nor the highest heavens be too far to reach eternal God of endless flight. May I rise with you in freedom to the death and resurrection of truth and life, love and son. Give me a restored life, both with the divine and with humanity. May I live in the freedom you offer, truly, truly accepting it. Amen. So the Gospel lesson assigned for Sunday, March the 14th in the Common Lectionary of most Christian churches is from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 2, reading verses 13 to 22. And it's a little surprising in that it is a description of Jesus cleansing the temple, not after Palm Sunday, as he began his Holy Week ministry in the temple precincts, during the last fateful week of his life before he was arrested, put to death. But at the beginning of his ministry, John chapter 2, he also cleansed the temple. And it's two different occasions, you can tell, because the stories are told. Uh, there's similarity, but there's also difference. So let us listen to this story. This is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, frustrated with the inauthenticity of so much religiosity and busyness in the house of his father. John 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip out of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, this is Psalm 79, John quotes, zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69, sorry. Zeal for your house will consume me. 
The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign will you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish authorities then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus has spoken. Lord, may we believe the scripture and the word you have spoken. Amen. A very popular Celtic blessing. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the sun of peace to you. It's a curious reading that John, after his opening kind of prelude chapter of John's Gospel, as Jesus beginning his ministry, by cleansing the temple. And uh, it's interesting that the churches in their wisdom have decided to assign this lesson for the middle of Lent this year. It's as if our Lenten disciplines and our religious activities and our church involvement are meant to be confronted with this seal for his father's house that Jesus had. Have we turned our Father's house into a marketplace? All of our religious busyness and our social activities and everything else, are they off the mark? Are they not really? Even our Lenten disciplines and habits, are we just giving up something? Oh, every year I give up chocolate for Lent or whatever what it is, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, but are we really seeking and you've heard my, my definition of Celtic spirituality. Celtic Christian spirituality is adopting disciplines to our human spirit that opens our human spirit to be more receptive and in communion with God's spirit. Are we building a more appropriate spiritual house so that when the temple of Jesus' body was put to death on the cross, but he rose again in three days to create the temple or the house of God in a renewed people empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter and John and Paul all speak about this New Testament, you know, truly. So it's a good time to be confronted with this and to hear Jesus' zeal, you know, and concern and to ask about our religious life. Is it enabling a truly spiritual life or even our spiritual life? It's enabling us really to become closer in communion with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and closer love to others. It's helping us to readdress the imbalance. David Cole loves to speak about imbalance and balance, which is a very Celtic theme. You know, sin is when something in the created life that we enjoy is out of balance, and it needs to be placed back into the service of God. You know, including our emotions, including our everything about our humanity, to be placed in the service of God, worshiping the Father, walking with Jesus, open to the guidance of the Spirit. And so uh, to get to this theme, I want to talk about three things. And all of them are um, traditions that are called ancient Celtic Christians in amongst the teachers of Celtic Christian spirituality. And none of them are. All of them are very, very recent indeed. But that doesn't mean that if we adopt these Celtic Christian traditions, and if we got them from a few, a, a few previous generations, they may not be hundreds and cent of years and centuries old, but it doesn't matter. We've inherited them in our generation today. 
and we may respect them, but are they, we allowing them to really get us into the true Celtic spirituality? Or are we just kind of um, understanding them in too superficial a way? So the first one I want to talk about is the poem, Deep Peace of the Running Wave to You. And I've put the full poem on the back of my bulletin on the script page. It's quite a bit longer, but because of the music of John Rutter and other quotations in hymn books and prayer books and so on, and in Celtic Christian writings, we have this fivefold line, a deep peace of the running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the sun of peace to you, and is attributed to Fiona MacLeod. Well, actually, there was no Fiona MacLeod directly. It was a chap named William Sharp who died in 1905. He was a member of the Edinburgh Celtic Circle, this uh, romantic revival of, of Celtic um, ways, looking even past Christianity to um, romantic reconstructions of Celtic spirituality, pre-Christian Celtic spirituality, the Druids and so on, of which we know very little. And he wrote a novel in 1895, or a, an anthology of short stories in 1895, called The Domain of Dreams. And in the story called The Amadan, the domain of dreams under a dark star, and in the story of The Amadan, he writes about a chap called Alistair McKeon who suffers from terrible mental illness. And he meets a Celtic Christian healer, healer named Alan Dahl, who with a charm and a prayer heals his mental illness and he finds fullness of life by trusting in God, his faith is restored and being open to love others. And it's a wonderful story. Now, what, William Sharp is a very interesting character. He wasn't just using a pseudonym when he wrote as Fiona MacLeod. He wanted to explore his inner femininity today, perhaps, you might think that he um, was a, a non-binary person or a transgender person, but you can imagine at the end of the 19th century, this is not something that would be accepted or even tolerated in society. And so he wrote under Fiona MacLeod, and he fooled many, including William Butler Yeats, who, when he found this out, eventually was reconciled to the fact that this is what um, Alistair McKee, I'm sorry, what... Um, uh, William Sharp had to do for his own mental health. Uh, Sharp became very critical of faith and everything as he tried to sort all this out and uh, get away from the authoritarianism, you know, and superficiality of so much conventional Christianity of his day. And yet in the end, he found an inner healing through this alter ego of Fiona MacLeod, who was supposed to be uh, this Highland Christian woman. And this is how he expressed himself. So it's interesting that he found this deep peace himself in this unusual way. In 1906, William Butler Yeats said, he was a great genius and a great mystery too. And to talk to him was to feel the presence of a mystery he was very near always to the world where he now is. Butler was right, or Yeats was writing to his, Sharp's widow after his death. And so I find that really quite remarkable. So stop making my father's house a marking, a marketplace, said Jesus. And here in the author, really a modern author, Writing uh, under a, a feminine alter ego, wrote this beautiful prayer claiming the peace of the Son of Peace, of the triune God of Celtic Christianity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and offering that in a short story uh, in his own way, in the time of this romantic revival of Celtic spirituality, 
as a, a source of peace and inner healing. And it wasn't very conventional. It wasn't the sort of thing you'd find in a Presbyterian church in the Highlands or whatever. But he found this. And so how much of our Christian practices are making our Father's house a marketplace? Even our interest in Celtic spirituality, you know, all the stuff we buy and the um, plaques we put up and the books we read and uh, all this sort of thing. How much of these are truly seeking an inner renewal of communion with the Creator, with the Redeemer, with the Sanctifier, or the Saint Maker, I prefer to call her, the Holy Spirit? So I think we can claim this poem, Deep Peace, for the counter-Christian tradition, but it's, it's a modern poem of an ongoing living tradition of us who are seeking to recover from the inspiration and the wisdom and the example of the Celtic Christian saints, uh, an authentic spirituality in Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for ourselves today. But during Lent is a time to kind of look at all that and to make sure that it's serving its high purpose. Because after all, we're told that it was an ancient Celtic Christian tradition that the Christians understood the Holy Spirit to be the wild goose. That instead of the tame, harmless dove, the Celtic Christians thought of the Holy Spirit as the wild goose. And so there's to be an authentic, adventuresome spirit and creativity to our spirituality. Open to the spirit who doesn't live by conventional ways, as Jesus says in John chapter 3, the wind will blow where it wills, and so it is with uh, those who are born from above, born of the Spirit. Okay. The disciples, when they saw Jesus cleanse the temple, Psalm 69 verse 9 came to mind for them. Zeal for my for your house will consume me. They could see that Jesus was going to get himself into trouble with his passionate witness to a spiritual integrity and justice and the truth of the scriptures, which he felt was being neglected. And so he would do something wild like this, the wild goose of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Ian Bradley, who wrote the, the book, The Celtic Way, very popular book, in 1999, wrote a kind of a personal confession, Celtic Christianity, Making Myths and Chasing Dreams. This is published in Edinburgh, 1999. And what it is, is Ian Bradley, who was a great scholar, in spite of his love for Celtic Christianity and how it brought renewal to his faith and to his ministry as a Church of Scotland minister, began to realize how much of the so-called revival of Celtic Christianity that's been going on for three centuries now is really based on Romanticism and is not true. And he mentioned in his preface that it's kind of a confession of the fact that it wasn't. Now, later on, in fact, just... More recently, he wrote a book following the Celtic Way, where it's kind of a post-critical naivety, scholars would call it, where after all of his analysis of the difference between the early Celtic tradition and popular Celtic Christianity today, he looks and he comes up with, uh, I think it's 22 Celtic insights and practices that can enrich our faith today. So in Bradley is very much someone who wants to find the real Celtic Christian uh, spirit and practices and commend them to the church today. And what he points out is that there's no evidence of the Celtic Christians ever calling the Holy Spirit the wild goose until George MacLeod, the founder of the modern Iona community in the 20th century. George MacLeod was a soldier in the First World War. He served and he got to know many Irish 
soldiers serving in Irish regiments, and the Irish soldiers were nicknamed the wild geese. Now, when he founded, refounded the Iona community, he was very much influenced by St. Martin, the great um, Gaulish saint who had such an impact on the early Celtic Christian missioners and uh, monastics. And um, Martin was called a soldier of Christ. He had been a Roman soldier who had become a full-time Christian missionary, of course, and eventually a bishop. Uh, Miles Christi, military Christian, and um, MacLeod liked to call the members of his community Christian soldiers. And Miles Christi, MacLeod became a pacifist after the horrible experience of the First World War. And uh, he found the Iona community and sought a renewal of Celtic Christian spirituality because this is what was needed to bring the gospel to that would allow healing and renewal to European society that had degenerated into the terrible bloodshed of World War One and, and so on, and the Second World War Two, And so um, he was the one who overheard, um, who learned of um, this idea. He invented it, that the Holy Spirit is not like a tame dove, you know, nicely set in stained glass no windows in the churches but as a wild goose and we christians need to be more like the holy spirit who cre created and animates the wild goose and so it's not really an authentic um expression of early counter christian spirituality but that doesn't mean it's coming from the great modern celtic saint george MacLeod, and uh it doesn't mean it doesn't have its power and its value for today Jesus said, zeal for your house will consume me. And we have to have a zeal for this household or family of God's people that will help us to be creative, adventurous, even courageous, even standing up in the face of injustice for the sake of authenticity. And the Celtic saints who were just as willing to curse evil and injustice and inauthentic behavior, even amongst clergy. I think of uh, St. Columbanus's letters to the Bishop of Rome, saying, you're the Bishop of Rome, we Irish respect that. You know, you're the focal center of the church. You gotta stop, you gotta start living like a Christian. You know, <laughs> like, like that kind of zeal for God's house. We need to have that for our own personal Christian walk and for the community to which we belong, a prophetic ministry like George MacLeod's was. For many years, George MacLeod was thought a kind of a nut case. He took all these unemployed tradesmen and idealistic clergy and took them over to the island of Ione. He's going to restart the monastery of St. Colum Colum Columba, you know, kind of crazy, you know. And uh, uh, he was a pacifist. Imagine how much sense that made in the 1920s and 1930s, you know. A pacifist, for Pete's sake, you know, in the British Empire, for goodness sakes. And, you know, but eventually, of course, his wisdom and his integrity went out and he became elected moderator of the Church of Scotland, for goodness sakes. Because, you know, people could see in the wild goose of the Holy Spirit, in his spirit, something real, something that would, you know, bring authenticity back to the tired old conventional Church of Scotland of all things. So there it is. The early Celtic Christians spoke about the white martyrdom, eh? About moving away from all the securities of our own village and our own clan or extended family. This was the social security of a subsistent agriculture economy of the time. To move away from that and to be adventurous and go off, you know, for the sake of the gospel and for bringing the good news of Jesus to foreigners, you know, and, and, and how um, this was the white martyrdom, you know, and we too need to step out of, out of our securities and do this for others. The third myth I want us to be more realistic about, got the poem, The Deep Peace of the Running Wave to you, which is like a banner of our movement. We've got the image of 
the Holy Spirit is a wild goose, which is such a symbol of our movement and its desire for an authentic and courageous and creative uh, communion in the Holy Spirit. And now we've got a third one. Um, and that is the image of thin places. Now, several scholars have noted that the Highlanders had a saying that heaven was only three feet above the top of our heads. The other world, to use an older Celtic phrase, wasn't something way over there or way beyond there, something very close to this world. And that is true. But the image of a thin place actually comes to us from a Scottish gardener who had a conversation with Evelyn Underhill, the great Anglican mystic. And Evelyn Underhill heard this old Scottish gardener talk about Iona and what a sacred place Iona was. And he said it was a thin place. Heaven is very close on the island of Iona. Now the image of a thin place, of course, is a very popular image. And it speaks even to non-Christian people that there are places where the other world, if you use an older Celtic phrase, eternity, the spirit, deeper dimensions of our created world are very mystically close to us. And that's a fact. And everybody recognizes that. Even atheists kind of recognize that. The famous atheist, although he converted to Christ uh, on his deathbed, Jean-Paul Sartre, said when he got up in the morning and he opened the door you know, uh, to on the riverbank in Paris, and the sun was shining and the birds were singing. He said he took everything within me not to want to give thanks to something. <laughs> and uh, so it's a real experience. But it, it comes to us from a Scottish gardener that was trying to describe his experience of the closeness of heaven to earth on the island of Iona. And there's no earlier reference than that in the early 20th century. And again, that great romantic, the Reverend Dr. George MacLeod, founder of the Iona community, picked up on this phrase and popularized it, that Iona is a thin place. And now it's gone all over the place. The evangelical author Tracy Bowser has a wonderful book, Thin Places, an Evangelical Journey into Celtic Christianity. And Bowser talks about these thin places. You know, but what's interesting is when Bowser speaks about that, the book comes to the conclusion that a thin place depends upon one's own spirit or the spirit of the community. And this makes sense to me because when counter Christians founded a new community or an individual Celtic Christian opened up a hermitage or something, you know, in their, as they began their hermetic life, they prayed and they fasted to bless, whether it's Iona or Lindisfarne or some of these deserts, these, these isolated places, you know, in, in the Hebrides and off the coast of Wales and Ireland and everything else. But you see, they made it holy by their prayers and their spiritual discipline. And I've experienced that. Um, one of my parishes is a beautiful old church that was pretty well abandoned. In fact, after I ceased being the rector of that parish, uh, it ended up being torn down, unfortunately. But when you sat in that church, it was definitely a thin place. And I discovered that the indigenous people in New Brunswick used to go. There was a church that kind of was built on a pinch that out in the middle of a swamp. So it was full of mosquitoes. But uh, the indigenous people of New Brunswick, the, the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people, used to go there in order to find sweet grass. Sweet grass doesn't grow everywhere, and but this was a place where it did grow. And they would pick the sweet grass, and the church was named for Saint Anne. Uh, the 
mother of the Virgin Mary, according to Catholic legend. And um, St. Anne is the patron saint of Mi'kmaq and Maliseet Christians. And so they would visit this abandoned church and they would write little notes in the, in the guest book and they would pray and they would burn their sweet grass. I didn't know about all this at first. I never ran into any of these indigenous um, uh, pilgrims, but nonetheless, I, I read their writings in the guest book. You see, they, they found that to be a very hard place. Why? Because for a century and a half, an amazing community of Anglican Christians had worshipped there and prayed there. So there are thin places all over the world, but these thin places are thin for a reason. Because human beings created in the image of God and filled with the Holy Spirit in whatever way, even if they're of a different tradition other than Christianity, have prayed there, have meditated there, have reflected there, have worshipped there, and that is what makes it a thin place. And uh, Walzer talks about that late in the book, you know. Um, so even though it's a modern idea, this notion of a thin place, again, we can't pretend that the early Celtic Christians had this kind of language. What they would want is sanctified ground, a holy place, and they would they would claim that by claiming it for God, maybe erecting a Celtic cross, you know, or other signs, and praying and fasting, you know, and singing the psalms over it and claiming it claiming the fallen creation to be redeemed by the Father through the blood of Jesus, by the present power of the Holy Spirit, ministering through Christians in that place and worshipping through them. And so what I'm saying is let's not abandon this idea of a thin place, even though it doesn't go back to the early Celtic Christian movement. Let's claim it. It's been given to us by people like Evelyn Underhill or George MacLeod, and they are great saints in their own rights that we can learn from in our generation now. And let's claim it for ourselves. And to think about how can we make where we live, or the church where we worship, or the social agency where we volunteer, or the place where we work, how can we, with the help of the Holy Spirit, the wild goose, Claim that for Jesus and make it a thin place. Even some of our churches need to be reclaimed, I think. You know, for that authentic, authentic spirituality. John tells us that after Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples realized that when he said, destroy this, bar, this temple and I will raise it up in three days, he was speaking of the temple of his body. So it's no longer going to be the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem. That will be the focus of God's dwelling amongst people. God dwelt amongst the Israelites in, um, in faithfulness to this promise he gave the Israelites that he would be dwelling above the Ark of the Covenant. But that was only to prepare and to teach and to prepare people for his dwelling among us in person in Jesus and his dwelling among us in person by the power of the Holy Spirit. And although the temple wasn't a thin place for Jesus, it had become a marketplace. And maybe we find our own churches and our own um, uh, places that way. We can claim them back. So for goodness sake, if you go on a pilgrimage, you're a pilgrim, not a tourist. Okay. And I mean the history of the place and the beauty of the place and the souvenirs and all of that, the pubs, all of that is part of it because God is God of life. And Jesus teaches us to enjoy life. We'll turn the water of our domestic, um, you know, uh, chores into the wine of gladness for us, like he did at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee in the first part of chapter 2. But are we truly pilgrims 
And are we looking? Are we open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the wild goose, to help us to offer prayer of blessing for deep peace of the Son of Peace and make that place a thin place. And that is our challenge today. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord of the fire, kindle within me the passion that drives love, so that I may live for you with all my strength. Burn within me a fire that consumes my whole being. Engulf me in your holy fire that falls from heaven into the center of my being. Kindle the flame within my heart, Lord, that it might ignite others whose lives touch mine. Amen. After my dad remarried a Christian woman and we became a church-going family, this is one of the hymns we often sang in my church, a church of a, a great, rich, uh, Methodist spiritual heritage. And this is one of the songs we sang all the time. It comes from the Book of Hours, 1514. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in mine eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at mine end and at my departing. Our prayers of supplication. These are two prayers called the Eye of the Ego by David Adam. Open our eyes. Give us, Lord, the eye of the ego. Open our eyes that we may see the wonder of you in all things. Open our eyes to the things of heaven and the spiritual realm. Give us vision to see clearly what you have for us. A clear vision of the path you have set before us that we may follow you in all we do. Give us the eye of an eagle, that we may see further, more clearly, and be able to look directly into the sun of righteousness. As the eagle flies the highest and sees the furthest of any bird, may we, Lord, soar high in your presence, and see further into you. May we know your wind, your spirit beneath our wings, lifting us above the trials and troubles we face. May we have the single eye that focuses on you, and in so doing, not be distracted by all else that goes on about us. May the eagle be an inspiration to us, inspiring us to get closer to you, to see what you see, and to know what you know. Father of creation, high King of heaven, great spirit of counsel, almighty three in one, we give all our days into your hands, the day, all that they are, all that they hold, and all that they will be. We give them to you. All the stresses and strains, trials and tribulations that come our way, we give them to you. That we would take on none of them. All the honor and worth, praise and glory that would come our way, we give them to you. That we would take on none of them.
keep our feet on the path you have set before us, so that this life you have set before each of us, before we were ever born, may be fulfilled. May your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path from this day forth. Amen. Beautiful it is that God shall save me. Beautiful too, the bright fish in the lake. Beautiful too, the sun in the sky. The beauty of an eagle on the shore when the tide is full. Beautiful the covenant of the creator with earth. The beauty in the wilderness of dull and fawn. The beauty of wild leeks and the berries of harvest. The beauty of the heather when it turns purple. Beautiful the pasture land. The beauty of water shimmering. The beauty of the world where the Trinity speaks. But the loveliest of all is the Christ, who lives in all beauty. Uh, David Cole adapted that from the 13th century Welsh, The Loves of Taliesin. And it's found in a, a, a fifth book of his, The Mystic Path, sorry, sixth book uh, that I mentioned here. The Mystic Path of Meditation, Beginning a Christ-Centered Journey, which he published in 2013. Now I'd like us to join in the Lord's Prayer. But I'm going to allow our thoughts to be guided by David Adam. Sorry, David Cole. Sorry, David Cole. The Lord's Prayer, in pages 34 to 41 of his Celtic prayers and practices. Our Father in heaven, we address the Father. We are affirming our relationship with the divine. What does it mean, wow, to be a child of the divine? We acknowledge that God is exalted and above us and beyond us, and that he loves us as a father. We are still close enough, places thin, for him to address us and embrace us. Hallowed be your name. This, of course, is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. Sorry, the third of the Ten Commandments. You shall not speak the name of the Lord in vain. Hallowed means to be sacred, to be special, to be adored, to be reverenced. Let us not keep God in our back pocket. Let us allow the awe of this mystery who loves us and has given us this amazing privilege of life, the miraculous privilege of faith. Holy, holy, holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how we long for God's will to be done. How we long to know God's kingdom, even those momentary experiences of thin places, you know, never satisfy us, do they, in this life? How we long to move on beyond our busy consciousness and our own egos to this place of communion and awe and love. May it be done on earth as it is in heaven. May that love, that authenticity be alive. May that deep peace of the running wave, that deep peace of the flowing air, that deep peace of the quiet earth, the deep peace of the shining stars, the deep peace of the sun of peace be something that we bring 
and animate in blessing around us by the Spirit. May we, may God's will be done on earth as we long to experience it being done in heaven. We pray for our world, our personal world in which we are placed and where we live, from our own spirits outwards that peace. Give us to stay our daily bread. We always take so much for granted. And everything God provides. And note in the Lord's Prayer, we only pray for bread for today. God will provide. We're praying that we may live by faith and accept what God provides for today and be freed from all anxiety and be grateful. Never mind about the grocery money for next week. Let us be generous so that many people won't have to mind for that. We're called to be fully present in this moment. Give us our bread, our daily bread, our bread for today. Lord, nourish us and strengthen us and may today be authentic. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. May your forgiveness not simply be an excusing grace, but as the Celtic Christians understood it, and Pelagius himself so deeply wrote about it, may be an enabling grace. May your forgiveness not just flow to us, may it flow through us as we forgive those who trespass against us, and may we be agents of mercy and of new beginnings, not accepting what's negative or hurtful or evil, not saying it doesn't matter, but saying it's not as important as our friendship. It's not as important as our relationship. Forgiveness is a choice and we can choose to forgive and it's only then that God's forgiveness is really at work through us. Letting go of grudges, releasing injuries done to us, giving them to God, to the divine presence. Who may we forgive? Can we let it go? Well, Jesus hope we can. We can call on the wild goose to come to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There are dark powers in our world in our society. Bigger than us, but they're smaller than God. Some of these dark powers come from within. The fallen nature that is part of what we've inherited as human beings. But that original sin of selfishness and fear it's not as big as the original greatness and goodness that our Creator has given to us. And the lie, of course, is that it is. That's the lie, that's the temptation. But we can resist. We can call on the strength of the Spirit. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, may we know deliverance in this world. May we know healing in this world. May we know progress in this world. Where do we need deliverance? Where do we need deliverance today? Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for spending this time in prayer with me together across the internet. Our spirits are one. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart.
church not be all else to me save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my light be thou my wisdom and thou my true word i ever with thee and thou with me lord thou my great father thine own may i be e thou in me dwelling and i one with thee riches i heed not nor the world's empty praise thou mine inheritance now and always thou and thou only first in my heart high king of heaven my treasure thou art high king of heaven after victory won may i reach heaven's joys o bright heaven's sun heart of mine own heart whatever befall still be my vision o ruler of all God's blessing be yours, and well may it befall you. Christ's blessing be yours, and well be you entreated. Spirit's blessing be yours, and well spend you your lives. Each day that you rise up, each day that you lie down, may the eye of the great God, the eye of the God of glory, the eye of the virgin Son, the eye of the gentle Spirit, aid you and shepherd you in every time, in every season, pour upon you every hour, mildly and generously. Amen.